Hi, Chem 151 students. Welcome back for week three. Uh, this week we're going to begin to talk about the uh, content of chapter 16 in your textbook, which is chemical kinetics. Uh, chemical kinetics is the study of how fast chemical reactions happen. And so that's a brand new topic. You've described chemical reactions with chemical equations in the past. Uh, but not much has been said in your previous studies in, in general chemistry about how fast reactions happen or why they happen. Why they happen uh, and how to determine if they will happen is something we'll, dis we'll discuss later. But the topic of this chapter is how fast reactions happen. So we know some chemical reactions happen very slow, like the rusting of this car, as you can see in the, um, the top frame here. Some reactions happen very quickly. And so how can we describe you, what can we do to describe how quickly a reaction will happen relative to another? And how can we explain how, how some reactions go faster than others and the details and what's happening in those reactions? So this week we're going to be just describing how fast reactions go. And then as we move into next week, we'll start, we'll begin to describe why they happen slow or fast and what are the steps in which they are, they are happening. This is referred to the steps that are are happening in a reaction are referred to as the mechanism. So we'll be studying rates this week and next week we'll focus more on mechanisms and explanations for why reactions happen or rather why they happen fast or slow. Um, so what we can see here is a couple of diagrams that indicate two reactions that are going on in which reactant molecules are being turned into product molecules so at the, in the top frame, we have reactant molecules here that are purple. In the bottom frame, set of frames here, we have reactant molecules that are blue. And as the top reaction is progressing, the molecules are, are turning from purple molecules to new, brand new green molecules. And in, in the same period of time on the bottom, we've got uh, blue molecules turning into yellow molecules. But as you can see, as, we, as the time progresses, the green molecules are appearing from the purple molecules much faster than the yellow ones are. The top reaction is going more quickly. And this is a picture of that on a molecular level. So <clears throat> what we'd like to do is have a way to describe how quickly or slowly reactions are happening. So let's first talk about what causes a reaction to happen fast or slow. We'll go into more detail on this next week, but we'll talk about the basics of it right now. First of all, in order for a reaction to happen, particles must hit one another and they must collide. When they collide, that results in old bonds being broken, new bonds being formed. Uh, the higher the concentration of the reactants, the more likely they are to co collide. And so this greater likelihood of collision results in a faster reaction. So at higher concentrations, uh, reactant particles will, will collide more often, yes. Uh, also what matters is the physical state of the reactants. So reactions that are occurring in the gas phase where all the molecules are free to move around and hit each other, or, uh, uh, or in the aqueous phase where all of the, the components of the aqueous solution can move around and, and freely all throughout the solution those reactions tend to happen quite quickly. However, if you have a, like two blocks of solid touching one another, the reaction can only happen where those two solids are touching. And so the physical state of the, re the reactant uh, definitely affects how fast it would. The substances have to mix in order for their particles to collide. So if all you have is two you know, solid chunks touching each other, that's not going to lead to a reaction that's as fast as when the molecules can fully mix, like in, a, in the gas state. <clears throat> Temperature significantly affects the rates of reactions. You may know this if you ever left a gallon of milk on your, on your uh, counter, right? If it's in the fridge, a gallon of milk may last a week or two. But if you leave it on the counter for a few hours, all the biochemical reactions going on, the bacteria that are spoiling the milk happen much more quickly. And the, the milk that might have lasted a couple weeks in the fridge, fridge 
will now only last a couple hours at most on the counter. And so uh, temperature really affects the rate of reactions. At higher temperatures, the particles have more energy, so they're moving more quickly and will collide more often. And when they do collide, they'll hit each other harder, which as we'll see later, results in a greater likelihood of a reaction occurring. <clears throat> So here's a, a, a picture that shows you how the physical state affects the rate of the reaction. Uh, if you have, if you're trying to burn iron, you can burn metals. Uh, <clears throat> if fireworks, for example, are metals burning, if you try to burn an iron nail, even if you get it really hot, uh, it's just going to be the outside that is reacting with oxygen in the air. However, if you have steel wool, which is the same, you know, made out of the same steel as the iron, but it has lots of uh, surface area to react with the oxygen in the air, the reaction will occur much more quickly. <clears throat> so it all, the, the, the rate of reaction does significantly uh, depend on the surface area exposed. Uh, that's very true in, for example, your car. There's a, there's a catalytic converter in your car uh, that the gases pass through in order to be converted from uh, pollutants that are made in the combustion in your engine into normal air, nitrogen and oxygen. And these are very porous with a lot of surface area so that that reaction can happen very quickly while the exhaust is going through the cat catalytic converter and out the, uh, the tailpipe of your car. <clears throat> so surface area definitely has a big impact on reaction rate. For a reaction to happen, the molecules must not only collide, but they must collide in the proper orientation and with enough energy so that old bonds can be broken and new ones can be made. So in this reaction here, what's, what's, uh, what makes the reaction happen is this oxygen atom pops off of the ozone or O3 and it's going to stick itself over here. So in order for that to happen, you need a very energetic collision so that this bond right here can be broken and a new one can start to be made between this oxygen atom and this nitrogen atom. And so uh, this is why reactions happen much more quickly at higher temperatures too. The molecules are moving faster and so a greater fraction of the collisions have sufficient energy in order to uh, to, for, the, for the old bonds to be broken so that new ones can be made. So how are we going to express on a, you know, a, as data on a piece of paper or in our papers that we write how fast a reaction is going? Uh, the reaction rate is going to be measured in terms of the change of a concentration over a certain change in time. Uh, so if we were talking about just some general uh, generic reaction where reactant A is reacting to produce product B and we measure the concentration of the reactant at one time and then another time. Our rate is going to be the change in the concentration over the change in time. So it will be the concentration of our reactant at the second time minus the concentration that we started with we do the final concentration minus the initial concentration or the second concentration minus the first here uh, because this will be negative if the concentration is going down and it will be positive if the concentration is increasing. So if the concentration uh, at the second time is less than the concentration at the beginning, this will give us a negative concentration here. <clears throat> uh, and this is uh, divided by the time, uh, time, the later time minus the initial time, so the change in time. And this delta here means change in. So that's the Greek letter delta, it means change in. So the change in time is the final, or the change in concentration is the final concentration minus the initial concentration. The change in time is the final time minus the initial time. Uh, and putting a negative here, uh, uh, is, is indicating that for reactants, the reactants are decreasing. And so since this change will be negative, putting a negative here makes it into a, a rate that is, is stated as a positive. And square brackets here indicate concentration in molarity. So this is a change in concentration of A 
over the change in time. And the negative sign again is being used because the concentration of A is decreasing, so this gives the rate a positive value. So here's an example of some real data of uh, the C2H4 act reacting with O3. We, we can measure one or both of the reactants. In this case, only we could also measure the, the rate from the product side, uh, but it's usually easier to measure the reactants. So here the concentration of ozone was measured. Um, and as time passed, whoops, as time passed, the concentration was going down. Uh, and if we want the rate, we want the change in the this reactant over the change in time or the change in this reactant, O3, over the change in time. And we put negatives here because, again, these are reactants, so we know their concentrations are going down. We put a negative so that turns the rate into a positive value. So uh, this is going to be expressed on the next slide as a graph. So here we have on the vertical axis the concentration of ozone. Uh, so it, and it's times 10 to the fifth, so this is 1 times 10 to the fifth, whoops, 2 times 10 to the fifth, 3 times 10 to the fifth, and so on. Uh, and what we can see here is this concentration is going down as time advances. So this is a time, 10 seconds, 20 seconds. But notice that, so the, con the actual values here are plotted. This was the first one, 0 times, 10 time, time 10, time 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. And notice that the, the pattern here is a curved one, okay, which is very, very common. Uh, this is because as the reaction is proceeding, the concentration of the ozone is going down. So remember that the speed of the reaction depends on how much of the reactants there are. So as the amount of reactant is decreasing, the, the speed of the reaction is also decreasing, which means when we talk about the rate of the reaction, it depends on what time period we're talking about. Are we talking about how fast the reaction was happening at the beginning or at the end or somewhere in the middle? And so for that reason, we have three types of ways we can state the reaction rate. We can state, I'll start with this one, the initial rate, the rate of the reaction at the very beginning, okay? Uh, or we can state the reaction at one particular, the rate of the reaction at one particular very specific time. Or we can state the rate, rate of the reaction over a period of time, which is often easier. So... A here represents the average reaction rate over the total 60 second period of time. Uh, so the, the reaction was going faster than, than this at the beginning, and it was going slower than this at the end. But over the 60 second period of time, uh, the average rate was 3.5 times 10 to the minus 7 molars per second. And this is what we get if we subtract the final the 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 final concentration which was you know a little over 1 times 10 to the minus 7 minus the initial concentration which was 3 point something times 10 to the minus 5 whoops but 10 to the minus 5 I meant uh, and then divide by 60 seconds okay so I'm actually going to go back to the last slide and calculate this just to demonstrate how it's done the last slide has the actual data so if we wanted to calculate that average rate over the whole 60 seconds, we would do the change in time, the change in concentration of ozone at the end. So, so the concentration at the end, 1.10 times 10 to the minus 5, minus the concentration at the beginning, 3.20 times 10 to the minus 5. And these are molarities. And we divide by the change in time, which was 60.0 seconds at the end minus 0, 0.0 seconds at the beginning. And we put a negative here to turn this into a positive rate. So let's go ahead and punch that into our calculator. It would be 1.10 EE negative 5 minus 3.20 EE negative 5 equals 
and then we divide this by 60 seconds and we want to change the sign that's what this negative in the front is for and turning that to scientific notation we get 3.5 times 10 to the minus 7 3.5 times 10 to the minus 7 and notice the the rate here rates are always in molarities per second that's the unit molarities per second this can also be written as uh, molarity times second to the minus one power. Those mean the same thing. Your book often writes it, so look at the units here. This says moles over liters over seconds. That's the way your book likes to write this. And another way to write this would be moles per liter times one over seconds. But moles per liter is molarity, so that's molarity times one over second. Uh, so you can say that's molarity times second to the minus one power, or you can call that molarities per second. All the same thing. But your book loves this, molarities over liters over seconds. <clears throat> so we could do a similar type of thing and calculate the average rate over the first 10 seconds. And you can see this is larger, this rate is larger. Yeah, the rate it's ha the reaction is happening more quickly at the beginning. You could do the average over the last 10 seconds here like we did. This is obviously lower uh, because the reaction is going slower. You can see it, it's slowing down. The concentration is not changing as much while the time changes. The other ways uh, to get a rea reaction rate are instantaneous rates. And so practically speaking, these can be difficult to get because, you know, your, your change in time is instantaneous, very, very small. Uh, <clears throat> the way these can be gotten is if you plot the data, you can determine the slope at a particular point. And that slope will be the rate of the reaction at that point. In the lab, what we often do is we just use a slower reaction and do it over a very short time and find the rate and that's almost an instantaneous rate you'll find that that's a strategy that we will use instead of trying to get the slope of the plot <clears throat> so if you get the slope of the curve here at um, at the very beginning that is the initial rate and the initial rate is the highest of all of these because the concentration of the reactants are the highest here the reaction is happening the fastest as we move forward, the reaction is happening more slowly. Uh, and this is, this is the instantaneous rate or the slope at this time, uh, at, this, uh, at this particular time, 35 seconds. And so this, these are the, the various, the three different ways that we can get a reaction rate. Practically speaking, we usually need some period of time. We just, if we want to get an instantaneous rate, or we would just try to make that time period very small, especially if we're trying to get an initial rate. Uh, so what's going on here in this reaction? Uh, well, in terms of products and reactants, the, the reactants, including C2H4, these are decreasing in concentration over time, and this is why the reaction is slowing down, because the concentration of reactants are lower and lower. As, as we move forward, the, 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 uh, the products, there are more and more of them. We start with no products, and then we get more and more and more of them. And depending on uh, what's going on in this reaction, we end, may end up with more products or less products. We'll talk about that more when we get to equilibrium in the next chapter. So uh, because this is one to one, the, the oxygen will increase at a rate that is equal to the, the rate that C2H4 decreases. So another thing we're often going to want to do is compare the rates at which the reactants are being used up to the rates at which the products are being produced. And so what we do is we, we, can compare, we can compare these across the board. For example, if we're comparing the reactants to one another, because every time one mole of C2H4 is used up, one mole of O3 is produced, their rates are equal to one another. 
every time an O3 is used up, a C2H4 is used up. So their rates are equal to one another. We have put a negative in front of their rates because again, they're reactants. So their, their concentrations are going down. And so by putting a negative here, we make this rate into a positive because these delta in concentrations are negative since the concentration is going down. For the products, these are also equal to the rates that the products are being produced because every time one mole of C2H4, for example, is used up, one mole of C2H4O is produced and one mole of oxygen is produced. And so these rates are all the same. The difference here is we, we don't put a negative in front of the rates for the products because their, their uh, concentrations are increasing. So they're going to have a positive delta up here. So we don't need to have a negative to change their sign. So this is the way it looks if the reaction has all ones as coefficients in the balanced equation. However, that's not true for a lot of other reactions. Uh, sometimes in those reactions, the amount of a product being produced or another reactant being used up will not be the same. So in this example here, every time one hydrogen is used up, two hydrogens are produced and so the rate of production of hydrogen is twice as much as the rate that uh, or sorry the rate of production of HI hydrogen iodide is twice as, as fast as the H2 that's being used up so H concentration of HI increases twice as fast as the H2 decreases so the way we can express these as equivalent rates here is what we're going to do is we're going to take the, the, the rate here and we're going to do one divided by the coefficient in the balanced equation in front of it. So here for the HI you can see the coefficient is 2. So when we're equating these rates to one another we would say that the rate for the H2 is equal to half of the rate of the HI because the HI is increasing twice as fast. So if we want this rate to be equal to what we've written here, we must cut the reaction rate of the HI in half to be equal to that of the H2. And again, we put a negative here in front of the rates that we've written for the reactants because they're being used up, and so their, delta, their deltas here are negative. We do not put a negative in front for the products. For all of them, we do 1 divide by their coefficient. Since these have a coefficient of 1 up here, 1, we write 1 over 1, which is just 1. But since HI has a coefficient of 2, we write 1 over 2 if we want to compare the, react the rates in this way. <clears throat> Another way we could write this is uh, we could multiply everything times 2. So if we multiplied everything here times 2, then we'd have 1 over 2, and this would be 1, like we see here. We multiply this one times 2, we get negative 2 times iodine concentration right here. If we multiply the HI or the H2 times 2, we get a 2. So these mean the same thing, this and this. So you may wonder, why did I write it first in this top way? And it's because if you're trying to compare all the different rates of all your reactants and products, you're going to have all kinds of different coefficients. And the most convenient way for you to write it will be this way up here. In, for the, in other more complicated reactions, you'll get all kinds of fractions here. And it will make you more confused if you don't first write it in this way. So I always suggest to write it in this way first, where you do 1 over the coefficient in the balanced equation and make sure to put negatives in front of your reactants. So here's the general form of this. If you have a reaction where you have reactants A and B, products C and D, and their coefficients in the balanced equation are A and B for A and B respectively, and C and D, the little ones, for C and D respectively, uh, the way you're going to write it is you're going to put 1 over the coefficient times delta of that concentration of that reactant over delta T and put a negative if it's a reactant. Don't put a negative if it's a product. And this sets all of these rate expressions equal to one another. 
Now often you won't need to compare the rates of all of these together. Maybe you will be interested in comparing the rate of uh, the consumption of A here to the rate of consumption of B. Let's say that's what you're interested in. Then you won't care about this. You'll just get rid of it. Or let's say you want to compare the, the rate at which reactant B is being consumed to the rate at which D is being produced. Well, then you would just set those two equal to each other and you wouldn't care about the other ones. You, but this gives you a way to write these out in a way that will always be correct without having to worry about weird fractions. It will always be one over the coefficient of whichever uh, reactant that you're interested in there. <clears throat> okay, so for example, for this reaction, N2 plus 3H2 makes 2NH3. Now this is a perfect example of where if you try to do this without doing it in the way that I've shown you, it's going to look very messy and you might get confused. What we're going to do is we're going to write these out. So, and there's going to be two ways of writing it. What I want to point out to you is I have used a little d here, and this is the first time that I've shown you this. Okay, so there's going to be two ways to write this. I'm going to use this one here as an example. Actually, I have it on the next one, so I'll show you. But basically, there's two ways, like delta concentration N2 over delta T, or D and concentration N2 over DT. This second way is basically the calculus way, and it indicates a very, very small period of time, uh, an instantaneous period of time. But they, these, are some, these are interchangeable in our class because we're not actually going to be doing uh, calculus. But your book will often write it in this way as well, in the ca calculus type of format. So the D is basically a very, very small delta, a very, very small period of time. So notice here what we've done is we put a negative 1 over 1, dN2 over dT. For the hydrogen, it's negative again because it's a reactant 1 over 3, dH2, dT. And then for the product here, we have a positive. You don't have to write the positive. I just wrote it there to emphasize that this is not negative. And then 1 over its coefficient 2 delta NH3, D, or D, NH3 dT. Now, uh, let's say that what I'm interested in is just these two. Then I can just get rid of this. So if I'm asked about these, and this is what you could write. You could write it either of these ways. Um, <clears throat> You could write it with the delta or the D. And notice what I did here. Okay, if you want to go ahead and make it not a fraction, multiply both by 3. If you multiply dN2 dT by 3, you get a 3 here. If you multiply this by 3, you get a 1. And you can write it with either the deltas like this or the Ds. That's okay for you to convert it to this. But trust me, always start with this. Okay, because you, you don't want to get confused about what your fraction should be here. And if you start this way every time, you'll be good. And what this is saying, when we write this this way, we're saying that the rate at which the hydrogen is consumed is three times the rate at which the nitrogen is consumed. Okay, looking at it this way, since this rate is three times this rate, if we want them to be equal, we have to cut this one in a third. Oh, what we're saying here, equivalently, is if we want this rate of nitrogen to be equal to the rate of hydrogen, we're going to have to multiply it by three, because the hydrogen is being used up three times as fast as the nitrogen is. But again, you want to start by using this. So your general form is, going back to the last slide, what we had here. Use this and then convert it any way you want after, okay? But don't let it be messy. Start like this, then convert to this if, you, if, you, if that's what makes you feel comfortable. So let's use this as an example. 
So here, ammonia is used as a plant fertilizer, which is true, and produced according to this reaction. If hydrogen is being consumed at a rate of 15 molars per minute, how fast is ammonia being produced? Okay, so again, we're, we're not interested in the ammonia, so we don't have to deal with it. Uh, we can simply write negative one over one, all right, uh, D or delta, either one's fine, DN2 DT equals negative also for the H2 since it's a reactant, one over three, D concentration of H2 DT. All right. And now um, I can multiply both sides by negative three if I like. I, I, uh, I should just, what I should do is I should solve for, uh, whoops, oh man, let me go back. I'm asked how much ammonia is being produced. And so I, I, uh, I'll, I'll continue actually. I'll, I'll write the ammonia one because I was asked about ammonia. So this is going to be positive one half D ammonia DT. Okay. And what I'm given is the rate for hydrogen. But what I want is the rate for ammonia. So I'm going to be using this part right here. So I want to solve for the ammonia. So what I'm going to do to solve for the ammonia is I'm going to multiply both sides by two. Okay. So when I multiply this, uh, this right side by two, I get D NH3 DT. As I multiplied it times two here, I'll put the times two over here and we're gonna do times two over here. And we're not gonna care about this because we weren't asked about it or it wasn't mentioned, the nitrogen. Okay, so if I multiply this times two, then my twos are gonna cancel here and I just get my DNH3DT, which is what I've written here. Now the other side is gonna be times two, so that's gonna be negative two thirds D concentration H2 DT or delta constant, D or delta, either one. So negative two thirds, and now here's where you gotta be careful. It's being consumed at this rate. So its rate is negative 15.0 molars per minute. Keep your units, don't forget to keep your units. And so uh, that's going to cancel our negatives here. And what we're going to get is two thirds of 15, which is 10. Write it with three sig figs, 10.0 molars per minute. That is the rate for the ammonia DNH3DT. And so I've written that right here for you. Uh, it's the same thing I did. So we, we were concerned here with the uh, ammonia and the hydrogen. We multiply both sides by two and then make sure that we put a negative rate in because the H2 is being consumed. We get 10 molars per minute. Don't forget your units. Really, really important here. And so uh, that's how you handle uh, comparing rates. And this is the introduction to, um, to uh, kinetics and the rates of chemical reactions. So in this, uh, in this lecture, we discussed what kinetics is, uh, what kinds of factors uh, affect the rates of reaction. We discuss how we can write the rates of reaction in, on paper and how we can calculate them from data. And we also uh, um, show how we could compare the rates of consumption or production of reactants and products in a single reaction. For the next lecture, we're going to talk about what's known as the rate law, which is a way of uh, using numbers to describe how fast a reaction is uh, as dependent on its concentration of reactants. And so I'll see you in the next one.